Well, I'm convinced. I hope you check out our To The World Conference, a great opportunity to be trained more in what it looks like to be on mission, wherever it is that God sends you from, to your grandchild, to across the world, or anywhere in between, a chance for you to be coached and developed and mentored. It's going to be so good to have Ashlyn back, uh, one of our longtime church members, church staff members, uh, who's now a missionary uh, full-time over in London with Redeemer's Queen Park Church. I just can't wait to see her in general, uh, but also to hear from her and her stories and to help uh, share what it looks like to really live a life on mission. If it's across the pond or if it's right here in Tallahassee, it's going to be a great time with the breakout session all things that will be happening. Uh, we're in a series called Tensions. My name is Dean, the pastor at City Church. Thanks for coming to Church in the Rain. Uh, I'm convinced if you go to Church in the Rain, Jesus likes you more. I'm just convinced. Uh, not really, but we're going to pretend that. And we're in a series called Tensions where we're looking at the reality that being living in a world that's not our own, Christians are spiritually citizens of another place. It's going to create some tensions in our lives. Things are going to rub. They're going to clash sometimes. They're going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to make us reevaluate how we think about things, how we see things, especially if you became a Christian. Christian later in life. You became, after 30 years of life, 40 years of life, 60 years of life, whatever it might be, it reiterates everything, reorients everything, I should say, in your life, make you rethink how you view this world and God's calling upon your life as a Christian. Uh, so one thing we're also committed here to as a church is to talk about some tough topics. Like we don't want to be a church that is silent about the things that really matter, especially things we see happening all across our town that are extremely difficult and extremely complicated, even things that cause a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. We believe that God's word and the truth of Jesus has a word to speak to us about all the brokenness in our society. So we're going to talk about today before I pray, just to give you a heads up. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. I think it's really important. We're going to talk about the tension of being pro-marriage in a post-marriage world. Being pro-marriage in a post-marriage world. Let's pray together. Lord, with this tough topic, Lord, I just actually speak through me this morning that we will receive all Scripture as good news for us to point us away from sin and from this world into life with you. We're thankful that you love us, that we matter to you. And since we matter to you so much, I ask that you will matter to us, starting in my own life, that I will live my life as someone who knows they're loved and that Jesus has died for my sins, and he rose from the grave, and what you have for us is far better than anything this world could ever offer. I ask you to speak through me today, keep the enemy out of this place, be with every person in this room, help us to receive your word, to have open ears and open hearts and open minds and open eyes to know and see and understand and receive who you are, what you've done for us, and why your design for marriage is the grand design for all of your people, and how we should pursue it and celebrate it and be unashamed of it. We also ask to be with all the churches in Tallahassee today uh, as they gather. Uh, may all of us talk about Christ and point people to great hope uh, found in Jesus rather than the things of this world. And we ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. So pro-marriage in a post-marriage world. So what is marriage besides just a husband and a wife and getting married and having a wedding? Marriage is the union between one man and one woman. And God's design for marriage and his intention is for it to last a lifetime. So let's be clear. Marriage is the union between one man and one woman. We can't compromise on that. We can't shift on that. It is as clear in the Bible as Jesus loves you and that he walked on water. It is a man and a woman and God's design for marriage. We didn't make it up. It's not our idea. God designed it and his intention, so he's a designer, has an intention. Any of you who are involved in architecture, any kind of design, when you design, you have a clear intention. So God has a design and an intention for it to last a lifetime. Now, just reading that, some of you might go, well, I'm condemned already, because I've failed here, I've messed up here, I've made mistakes here that I still regret, and I just want to let you know, this is not some assembly of perfect people who have it all figured out. This is an assembly, this is a hospital of grace, and that if you've already been through severe brokenness because of marriage, post-marriage, whatever it could be, I just want to let you know that God is not done with you, that he is for you. That in Jesus Christ, he does not condemn you. And this message is just as much for you today as the person that you think has a perfect marriage, even though they don't, who's maybe in your eyes, has never messed up. This is for all of us. You matter to God. And that didn't change because you got divorced. That didn't change because you had sexual sin in your life. That doesn't change because of mistakes, of brokenness you made in your past. I want to tell you that, and it's not because I'm supposed to say it, because I believe it from the scriptures that you matter to God. But here's what's happening right now in this pro-marriage and a post-marriage world. A generation is being raised up whose, even pa whose parents, whose friends, and popular culture encourage them to put marriage on the back burner. 
a way down the road afterthought you'll work your way to eventually. Brad Wilcox, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, go Cavaliers, uh, cited that in a recent Pew poll, it's a very professional, national, respected poll, found that 88% of parents believe that it is important for their kids to be financially independent. And by that, I don't mean they don't have to work and live off their investments. By that, he means they're on their own. They're not on their parents' bill. 88% of parents believe it's important for their kids to be financially independent and have careers they enjoy when they are adults. Great. Same survey. Only 21% said it is important that their kids get married. And only 20% believed it was important that they become parents by having children. So 88%, go chase your dreams, have a great career, be financially independent, do something you love. And then 21%, well, I guess it's good if they get married. Brad Wilcox's book, Get Married, is very helpful. It's just called Get Married. It's been a helpful tool for me in preparing for this. And the reality of where we live now in our culture in 2024, I'm not sure to say 2024 or 24, so I'm trying to transition to saying 24, so we'll get there. But in the year 24 is that marriage is now a capstone rather than a cornerstone. A capstone rather than a cornerstone, meaning rather marriage being something you build your life from, it's something you tack onto your life once you have enough life experience, live together for a while, get enough degrees, save enough money, then and only then, maybe, if it's convenient and you really want to, should you get married. And culture has flown downstream into the church where oftentimes Christians, without knowing it, our view of marriage is no different than the world's view of marriage. Jesus was asked about marriage in Mark chapter 10. We're told the story like this. He set out from there, this is Jesus, and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Then crowds converged on him again, and as was his custom, he taught them again. So people wanted to know what this one called Jesus had to say. They had heard about him. They'd seen him perform miracles, and they go to ask him questions, and oftentimes they weren't pure questions. They weren't questions someone wanted to ask in order to truly have them answered. It was to corner him, kind of a gotcha kind of thing. But Jesus wasn't faced. And it says he would teach them again. So here's one situation. Some Pharisees came to test him. So legalistic people trying to discredit Jesus and corner them with what they thought was Bible verses. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Simple question. Deep, but simple in terms of direct. Jesus knew what they were doing, what they were trying to get to. He replied to them, what did Moses command you? You know your Old Testament really well, tell me. They said, well, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. What a thought, send her away. That's the way that's worded. What's happening here is, throughout the Old Testament, rather than having God's design, people started going rogue started doing what they wanted to do, what, went, what, what they thought was right in their own eyes, multiple spouses, multiple partners, divorce, 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 over and over again. And God said, look, I'm just gonna, you're, you're made your bed, you're gonna lay in it. I'm just gonna give you to the desires of your heart and you're going to see the chaos and the brokenness that doing things out of my design, how, how it works and what actually takes place. So Jesus told them, he wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your hearts. That's why he did it. As in, you want this, go for it. See how it works for you. He goes, but I'm going to give you a history lesson to show you God's original design and intent. And he's going to quote Genesis. Because Jesus believed that Adam and Eve were real people and that Genesis was a historic event. I'm going to go with the one, I don't have all my questions answered about that, but I'm going to go with the one who was dead and came back to life three days later. He says, but from the beginning... From the beginning, as in there was a historic precedent, there actually was a plan, there was a design, God made them, he's the creator. Male and female. They were intentionally made different and he says, for this reason, there was an intention. A man will leave his father and mother and what will happen, the two will become one flesh. So from two to one, and this is more than a sexual union but it's not less. He says, therefore, because God's the creator, because God's the designer, because he had a purpose, therefore what God has joined together, you don't have the right to change. Let no one 
separate. In Matthew 19, haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning, it's a history lesson, he's quoting Genesis, made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one. So they're no longer two, but now they're one flesh. A oneness has taken place. A union of souls has come together. And because of that, God's the one who's brought them together. Not a marriage license, not the pastor. God has brought them together. Because it's God's design and God's intention, no one should separate. It's important to know that he's quoting from Genesis chapter 2. And what happens in Genesis chapter 3 is sin enters the world. So what does that mean for us? It's really important to grasp this. Marriage existed before sin existed. He created Adam and Eve and it was good. They were flourishing. This is my design. This is the union. So marriage isn't the problem. It's sin in marriage that's the problem. And what comes with sin when sin entered the world? The worship of self. Self-autonomy. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I'm an independent person. I'm not tied down to anyone else. We, yeah, we might be one, but we're actually two. And before sin happened, here's what the devil said to Adam and Eve. And he's been repeating it in different ways ever since. Did God really say? Did he really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Are you, you sure God said that? No, God told you you can have anything you want. You can flourish and live in freedom and relationship with me. I have created this world for my glory and for you to flourish as my people. There's one thing I'm telling you to do. Don't eat from that fruit from that tree. And what did they do? They believed there was more to be gained by disobeying God than there was to be gained by obeying him. They had to go around God with what they were looking for rather than right to him and they wound up eating the fruit from the tree and they sinned. And the devil's strategy was the same as it is today. Did God really say that? And when it comes to marriage, oftentimes in Tallahassee in 24, we continue to say we believe the Bible and believe in God and have been saved by Jesus, but are still asking the question to justify ourselves. Did God really say this? We have to reject it as what it is, a question from the devil. In her autobiography, Eat, Pray, and Love, Eat, Pray, Love, which later became a movie that Julia Roberts starred in, Liz Gilbert, here's the scene. She's sobbing at 3 a.m. on the bathroom floor of her upscale home in the New York suburbs that she shares with her husband, she's married. Tired of the mundane realities and responsibilities of married life. Impatient with weekends spent roaming the aisles of some box-shaped superstore of our choice. I'm like, why you gotta throw shade at Target like that and be disrespectful towards Target? and terrified of moving forward with their plan to have a child after she turned 30. Liz has a revelation on the floor of her bathroom in the middle of the night. I don't want to be married anymore. I don't want to live in this big house. I don't want to have a baby. So she abandons, leaves her husband to go halfway across the world to discover what it is she does want. And in her journey in search of sensuality, spirituality, and a soulmate, it takes her to Italy, where she indulges her senses, that's the eat. To India, where she seeks spiritual enlightenment, I roll, that's the pray. And to Indonesia, where she finally meets her soulmate, which is love, double I roll. I know it's the only thing I'm for is the eating part in this, but that's, that's another story for another time. What if... She asks, what if your life belongs to you? I believe that's one of the worst questions you can ask as a Christian and the worst person you can, one of the worst questions you can ask as a married person. Because we see in the scriptures when we become, we belong to Jesus. When we get, if we're saved from our sins, we're brought into God's family. We don't belong to ourselves or this world anymore. We belong to Christ. So that's a non-Christian question to ask. And in marriage, we're told that two become one. So my life doesn't belong to me anymore. We belong to each other. And this story of Liz Gilbert is not an outlier. Yeah, maybe travel the world and go to all those countries, sure. But the mindset and choices and what she's talking about, she might as well live north of I-10 in Tallahassee. 
And I am convinced, and we're going to talk about this kind of stuff, because we have to. Because we have a city who desperately needs to see the bigger picture than themselves of what God is doing through his design of marriage. So we're just not going to be a church that's silent. And I believe one of the greatest countercultural lights we can shine in a lost city is to be unashamed of what the Bible says about marriage. And that we will also repent from things like cohabitation and divorce and strive by God's grace and his love and his second chances to recover and pursue his design for his people. Cohabitation, the acceptable sin of our times where you have the benefits of marriage without the covenant of marriage. It's plain house. It's a faux kind of marriage. Oh, we're committed to each other, yeah, until one of you decides that you're not. And it does great damage, and statistics even show us the world even understands this, because those who cohabitate are the least likely to stay married if they eventually have that capstone as they see it and get married. And some people, again, I want to show a lot of grace here, because a lot of Christians, either one, just don't, they just don't know that. No one's ever told them that before. Well, what's wrong with it? We're saving money. Like, we're, you know, like, like what's, what's wrong with those things? It causes a lot of confusion. But the call upon your life is to follow Jesus. And what that looks like if you're in a relationship is to move towards marriage. Move towards marriage. There's no category for a Christian couple being intimate and living together outside of marriage except the category of sinful. People say, well, it's saving money. For one, I don't get how that's true. If you can both pay your rent it's, it together, why can't you at separate places? But that's another conversation for another time. But what we're saying when we declare that and point to money is that financial stability is of greater importance than sexual immorality and doing things God, by God's design. I don't believe you really think that. I want to be fair. But functionally, you're communicating that. And then the other one is, well, we're not sleeping together. Y'all. What's the old saying, child, please? I might be a Miami fan, but I'm not dumb. Give me a break. If you're not, then I'm worried about you actually in other kind of ways. But that's another story of another time as well. Move towards marriage. Make hard decisions that seem crazy to the world. A wedding is important. It's not that important. Marriage is. Engagement and photos and all the things, they're important, they're fun. They're not that important. Marriage is what's important. And then we see divorce, another sin that must be repented of in our city. And I believe the church universally has done a great disservice here for the last generation plus. And that is when no fault divorce entered the world. And it became commonplace. People would get married for whatever, or get divorced for whatever reason they want. The church went silent crickets. Radio silence. Why? Because you don't want people to leave. They might give money. Like Those are the kind of things that happen. So people become cowards at first, and then just, it's an afterthought, and just, just kind of gets assimilated into regular life after that. That's what some churches are doing in our community with homosexuality now. Some are just fully, like, whatever you love is love, all those kind of things. There's other churches who are orthodox, like they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They believe the Bible clearly, but they're silent on it because they're scared. So what happens down the road is it'll be fully assimilated, just like no-fault divorce. Mark 10, the main thing Jesus wants to say to his followers about divorce is don't do it. Don't do it. It's not God's intention for marriage. Genesis gives us God's intention that marriage is one man and one woman. The two will become one flesh. They leave their family and begin a new family of their own. And that new family now takes priority over all other allegiances they have in their lives, except for their allegiance to Jesus Christ. See, God himself joins the couple together. That's what Jesus wants them to see in the text, that God's the one who has done this. Therefore, this actually is a sacred institution. Verse 9, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It's not rules for the sake of rules. It's to be in step with the designer who cares about his glory, his creation, and cares about your flourishing of your soul. 
it's the main thing Jesus would say is, don't do it. It's not his intention. It's not what you promised before God in a room full of witnesses. You didn't say, maybe. So what he's doing in this encounter, Kevin DeYoung says, the Pharisees want to talk about acceptable reasons for divorce. Jesus wants to talk about the sanctity of marriage. They want to talk about when a marriage can be broken. Jesus wants to talk about why marriages shouldn't be broken. Think about this. If all you hear are the reasons a marriage covenant might be broken, that's all you hear about, all the exceptions, it's like learning to fly by practicing your crash landings or training for battle by practicing your retreats. Whatever the exceptions might be, the main thing is that marriage is supposed to be permanent. And there are a few things that Jesus does give us. Divorce is not always sinful. Please hear that. It's certainly permitted by Jesus when sexual sin has taken place. Hear me carefully here this morning. If you were divorced because, some, because your spouse in sexual sin committed adultery, it is not your fault. It is not your fault. Like, take a deep breath. It is not your fault. And every single person I have ever encountered who is married and commits adultery always blames the spouse. Well, they just don't value me and they don't love me as much anymore and don't pay attention to me or they gain 40 pounds or, or, or like, we're just, he just doesn't make the effort. She doesn't make the efforts anymore. Those type of, all those things might be true. But you chose to sin. Here's what I also know. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So for one person, it is not your fault. For the other person, there is grace for you. And there is love for you. And there is acceptance for you. And there is forgiveness for you. And new beginnings for you. So don't wallow in your past. Because when we wallow, yeah, you're going to regret it. Probably until Jesus comes back. Because there are consequences for your sins. But in terms of where you stand with God... You're not made right with God by a great marriage, and you're not made wrong with God by breaking your marriage. You're made right with God by the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. And that applies to all people who trust in Jesus. That's why we call the gospel good news. Good marriages don't get you to heaven. And sexual sin doesn't keep you from getting there because the blood of Jesus is for you. Sin keeps us from heaven if we never receive forgiveness for it. So Jesus gives that exception when sexual sin has taken place. And the other one is when you're, what's permitted when you're left by a spouse who is an unbeliever. Deserting by an unbelieving spouse. Maybe they don't see faith the way you seem faith. They don't have a relationship with Jesus like you do. They're anti-church. Uh, they think it's nuts that you're a Christian. They mock you for it. They, and as a result, they've left because of that. That's not your fault either. Those of you who stay the course in your marriage with an unbelieving spouse, the Bible encourages that and says shine as a light to that person. But you can't help it if someone says, I think this is crazy, I have different values, I have different beliefs, I'm out of here. That would be a permission. Another one I believe is really important to talk about for a moment would be situations of abuse. I believe that abuse is breaking the marriage covenant. So if you're in an abusive marriage, you do not have to stay in it. You do not. I also believe that there is forgiveness for even the abuser. It's for all people. But you don't have to stay in that situation. You don't have to stay in that marriage. Please reach out for help. Notice what aren't the exceptions. Notice he doesn't say, unless he doesn't support your dreams. Or unless she gets lazy. Or doesn't do her part around the house or doesn't go to Orange Theory as much as you do. People who have divorced and now are remarried, but it's been outside of scriptural grounds, I believe that you should stay as you are. You don't want to get divorced again. But also I think it's a Christian call for you to repent, to acknowledge that you're divorced on, on biblical grounds, receive forgiveness from Christ, And now, as a believer, I mean, we think as Christians, I don't expect people who aren't Christians to act or think like they are. If you're not a Christian in this world and you think I'm crazy, I think it's actually a good thing because we believe in a Savior who is not of this world. We don't expect people who aren't Christians to act like they are. I am a Christian and struggle acting like I am. So I don't expect someone else who's not a Christian. 
But I would suggest that you should make amends and ask for forgiveness and seek peace and reconciliation with your former spouse. In terms of maybe where you've wronged, maybe simply an apology, a conversation. Not even for that person, for you. To take a deep breath and go, you know what, as God has forgiven me, now I am forgiving this person. I think there's five ways we can change the game when it comes to marriage in our city. And the first one is this, stay married. Yes, there's exception clauses, we covered those, but stay married, keep divorce off the table. There's so much freedom in a marriage to flourish if it's not hanging over your head. How can you be secure with one another when that's constantly lingering? It's off the table, I tell my wife, if she leaves me, I'm going with her. And she likes to tell couples that we have premarital counseling with, if it's gonna be forever, it might as well not be miserable. So let's work at it. Let's do the things that we need to do to have a great marriage. But it's hard to do that when that lingers, that threat over there. The second thing is, I call it shenanigans, reject soulmate shenanigans. He's my soulmate, she's my soulmate. The only people that's that's ever made sense to is like a Western 21st century culture. That is the dumbest thing in the world. Because it puts a pressure on someone to be for you but they were never meant to be with you, for you. Yes, there's a oneness. Yes, there's a completion we see. It's not good for man to be alone. We see those type of things, but no one is your soulmate in the way we think about soulmate. Here's what happens. So when they're not producing in your feelings and emotions what you think someone should do who's your soulmate, and that connection's not there whenever you think it should be there, guess who the problem is? It's not you. It's that person that maybe you married the wrong one. We got married young, didn't know what we were doing, didn't experiment enough. I'm going to let you know who your soulmate is. Go home, get out your marriage license, see the name that's next to yours, and that is your soulmate the person you're married to. My wife could have married a gajillion people and would have been happy. She chose me, yo, but... (laughs) But she chose me. I probably could have married like 10 people, uh, but my odds are a little lower, uh, but... But I shot really high. (laughs) But she's not... we We don't see each other as soulmates. We see each other as husband and wife who have a oneness in Christ as God intended it to be, a, well, not just in Christ, but in our union together as husband and wife, and that we're to flourish in that till death do us part. Third thing is turn off the noise. Turn off the noise. An Atlantic editor defends her divorce from the father of three children, but acknowledges that she still loved her husband when she left him, and that he had done nothing to justify her decision to break their bond. But she was following a higher purpose, She'd come to realize that a man was standing between me and the world, between me and myself. Divorcing her husband opened new possibilities. By her account, she might have more time to devote to book writing opportunities and to try out sex with new partners. Atlantic's going, you do you. Look at you finding your true self. And that's not an outlier. That takes place in our city all the time. Years ago, I'm not going to betray any confidence, and I'll alter the story a little bit. I had someone reach out to me who I barely knew, acquaintance at best. I knew his spouse better than I knew him, just from kids stuff and all that. And he messaged me and said, hey, can we get together? And even though I had never had a conversation outside of a handshake, good to see you, like a kid pickup or something like that, I knew exactly what it was going to be about. Why? Because I'm active on Instagram. And I had seen the posts change from his wife. All of a sudden, he wasn't in the pictures anymore. Everything was a selfie. She looked perfect all the time by the world standards. She was always out with her divorce buddies who were man-haters. I mean, like, all, like it was just always gym and, and inspirational quotes and wellness this and wellness, just all the time. And I went, oh, no. Christy and I call it the watch list. So you can ask me later if you're on it. And... <laughs> It, it, is, it is where we just go, oh no, oh no. So when he reached out and said he'd talk to you, we sat down, go in the care room over there. He's a little nervous because you know, he doesn't know me very well. I'm a pastor. I get that can be weird for people or whatever. And we sit down and I said, I didn't, didn't let him start. I said, is this about, and I said his wife's name. 
He said, how do you know that? I said, man, I'm not psychic. I'm not even Pentecostal. I said, but I could just tell that something was up. And I told my wife, watch out. And he was like, and he walked me through exactly what I just told, what I just told you. Like, I knew it. That all these things started to change. She became self-obsessed and everything became about her. And what's the one mundane, it's eat, pray, love. What's the one mundane thing in my life that's keeping me from my dreams and my true self? And, oh, it's my spouse. And in those situations, they never speak badly about their spouse. She's a great mom. She's amazing. He's a good guy. You know, he works hard. Like, I appreciate him. We, we just grown apart. You may emotionally have grown apart, but you have not married grown apart. Because what God has brought together, no one should separate. So because of that, now do the work and reach out for help and say, we're going to care about this because God sees it as permanent. Be careful of the noise of culture telling you to go do what you want to do. Be careful of the noise of divorced friends, not who are recovering and who are hurting and are trying to get their lives back together, but I mean ones that are loud and proud and want you to be just like them. Turn off that noise. There's another noise you got to turn off. And that is if you're someone who has failed in this area, you've got to turn off the noise of the accuser, the devil who wants to make you think that you're still condemned and church isn't for you and Jesus isn't for you and you've messed up to a point there's some kind of stain upon your life. That is a lie. That's a lie. Reject that. Please reject that. You are not used goods. You have not failed your one chance. You're not done with God. Those are the lies of the devil. Scripture says, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. None, because the law of the spirit of Christ, of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. We've been freed from this, freed from the law of sin, free from death. In other words, I put it this way, others may accuse you, but God does not. Because Jesus, who never sinned, was accused and tried and sentenced to death in your place. With Jesus as your advocate, no one has the authority to condemn you. The next thing is be an ordinary Christian. If you want to improve your marriage, there is not a shortage of resources out there. They're everywhere. Podcasts, blogs, books, advice, getaway weekends, all those things are really good and really helpful, but how often are married believers told that the key to a successful marriage is to live an ordinary Christian life? Just live for Jesus together. And by that, I don't mean some nominal or lukewarm Christianity where the label of Christian only means you aren't Muslim or aren't atheist. But certainly ordinary, as scriptures describe and God requires, the life that Jesus saves us to in following him. Things like this, Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfless ambition or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. If you're told to consider these random people called others better than yourself, how great is the call for your spouse? in terms of how you treat him or her. Everything, everyone should not look, look at his own interests, but rather the interests of others. And the rest of Philippians 2 points us to how Jesus did that for us. So now we go and do that for one another. Ephesians 5, therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ loved us, not randomly, but because of responding to Jesus. And he gave himself for us, showing us what love really is, that sacrificial giving a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. It it pleased the Father. But sexual morality and impurity, it's the opposite of verses one and two. Or greed, shall even be heard of among you, as is proper for the saints. Why? You've been set free from those things. Ephesians chapter five, to sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself. And the wife is to respect her husband. That's the ordinary Christian life. Pursue that. The fifth thing and the last thing is your marriage is bigger than you may think. It is so much bigger than you. For this reason, Paul says, a man will leave his father and mother, he's quoting Genesis, and be joined to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, a union. The mystery is profound, it certainly is. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Wait, put the back up there, please. Slides person, woo Thank you. I thought you were talking about marriage. We've skipped to one verse, and now you're talking about Christ and the church. Which one is it? 
And Paul would say, yes. He's showing us that the union of a husband and wife is a visible portrait that points us to an invisible reality of the oneness of Christ and his church, Jesus and his bride. In other words, it is such a bigger story than your own personal story you wrote on the knot of how you met. It points to something greater. Visible portrait of invisible reality. Joe Carter, not the baseball player, said this, that a gospel-centered marriage serves as a living metaphor for Christ and his church in a world with temporary satisfactions and superficial commitments, marriages anchored in the gospel stand as beacons of hope. They're sacred covenants. They're not social contracts. And God is profoundly invested in them. Sam Alberry, who's a single man as a pastor, he writes that marriage shows us the shape of the gospel. It points to something bigger than ourselves, what God is doing in the world through his love, through Christ. He says in singleness shows us its sufficiency. And he's not trying to insult you by the old Christian culture language of, hey, single person, Jesus can be your boyfriend. It's like, oh my gosh. No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is the gospel understood in marriage is for all people. Because marriage shows us the big picture of the invisible reality of our union with Christ, that Jesus purchased his bride. He didn't cohabitate with us. He went all in and made us his bride. And because he is the answer, he is the fulfillment, he is the ultimate, it shows a single person and a married person the sufficiency of the gospel. That ultimately Jesus really is what we need. So I would ask you to please, we've got to be on mission here in Tallahassee and shine his lights. Point your kids to marriage. Point your adult kids to marriage when they're dating in a serious relationship. Don't buy, the, don't buy the lies of the world. Don't be the 88% that thinks they should have a great career, but not the 21% that thinks they should get married. I will always be thankful for my father-in-law. Always will respect him for this. I respect him he's a Christian man in general who loves his wife and loves his kids and grandchildren. But when I had the famous talk with him, you know, the I want to marry your daughter, can I, permission, blessing talk, I was 21. What's the famous question the dad asks when you ask for their daughter's hand in marriage? How are you going to support my daughter? If he'd asked me that, I'd have been like, you tell me, man. I have no idea. We were moving to Louisville, Kentucky for me to go to seminary. I was going to be a full-time student preparing for ministry. If he'd asked me that question, I, had no, I, have no, I don't know. If we're going to get jobs? He, he'd already known me for a year. That's just like a customary, traditional formality, unless the guy's like a... If it has to get towards the marriage question, for you to run the dude out, we got bigger problems at home, okay? But what a dumb question. How do you plan to support my daughter? That, that's what you're worried about? Like that? Like, it's okay, princess ain't gonna re eat ramen anyways, because we know you're gonna give her your credit card, so most of y'all, so... But... That's not the question. The question is a blessing. Yes, go, go. Go get married. Go build your life from this. So we moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and I, Chrissy, I went to school full-time. Chrissy got a full-time job at a hotel, and I worked part-time at Louisville Slugger talking about baseball bats, suffering for the Lord out there, let me tell you what. And we had, like, no money. Had this terrible apartment that I'm thankful she didn't leave when she saw it. And marriage is a cornerstone. It's not a capstone. You don't got to have bucket lists checked off and dreams fulfilled and money in the bank. You know how much money you need to get married? A month's living expenses. Build your life from it. We're so much like the world. I'm convinced the greatest, I, I come from wonderful parents and like basically I feel like I was born on third base and did not hit a triple, okay? That's how I feel. Um, I think the greatest thing that they have given my brother, sister, and I, which you don't realize when you're a kid but realize now is that they're married. But they're still married. Their anniversary is one year after my birthday. So I apologize to them every single year. That they're that young and already had, had me. I, I think it's the greatest thing to give my brother, sister, and I. I. I really do. And we have to be people who contend for this and contend for this and contend for this. People say, well, again, if, if you are thinking about getting divorced right now, please don't do it. I'm asking you as a Christian. It's not compatible with your Christian faith. God is not okay with it, He's not. You might go, it's, it's, it's going to 
It's going to affect your kids forever. Well, kids are resilient. Where do we come up with that? You have a, tr- a net around your trampoline. You track them on Life 360 every 10 seconds throughout the entire day. You own a figurative helicopter. You know they're not resilient. They're not supposed to be. But there's grace for you. Jesus was the most gentle, the most gentle and compassionate to ones who failed in these areas. The most gentle. He was the most hardcore with those who condemned people who had failed in these areas. Jesus can be tough. And who was he usually the toughest with? Those who wanted to throw stones at those who had, had brokenness and sin in their life. He is the most gentle and the most compassionate with those who are in sexual sin, relational brokenness, whatever it could be. And my hope for you is that you lean into that truth and that reality. We have to see this change in our town. We have to. Because we can't be like the world who says, whatever you want, whenever you want it, marriage is temporary. If, If you fell out of love, go love somebody else. Aren't you thankful God's not that way with you? Aren't you thankful? Jesus never divorces his bride. Oh, he had have a million reasons to. How often do we sin against him? Never divorces his bride. He doesn't cohabitate with his bride. He came and dwelt among us and gave his life that we may have life with him. So there's more to being a Christian than caring about marriage and being pro-marriage, but man, there's not less. And it's so easy to talk about the sexual revolution, all those kind of things, but sometimes you've got to clean up your own house. And that's the church in Tallahassee that it has so many scars and so much hurt and so much pain and has been sinned against so often and so much carelessness. And we have to say, no, Jesus gave us a better way. The call to, to follow Christ is a call to repent and to recover and pursue what he has given us. Let's be a church in every area of life that does that together. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for your grace. Oh, do we need it. We're thankful your love for us is deep. It truly is. When we came in fathom, we didn't have a word to fully grasp how much we are loved by you, that it took the death of Christ, the willing death of Jesus. You love the world, you sent your son. Lord, because we matter to you, Lord, I ask that you will put it upon our hearts for your word and your design to matter to us. For the one who has fallen in this area, has experienced brokenness in this area, I ask they walk out of here today not under condemnation, but under grace. For the one who is thinking about getting divorced right now for unbiblical reasons, Lord, I ask that you convict their hearts. They will be humbled, that you'll even break their hearts to the things that break yours. Because what you have brought together, nobody should separate. We're thankful that you see us as your bride and that Jesus is the great groom. So I ask that we will be that visible portrait through our marriages, future marriages in this room, to the rest of the world, that invisible reality that we are one with Jesus. And that takes precedent over everything else. Since we're one with Jesus, we want to continue to flourish in being one with our spouses. Thank you for new mercies. We thank you for forgiveness, second chances. We're thankful that you told the woman at the well that you had living water for her, that she could go back and live her new life despite her brokenness. And we're thankful you told the religious people who wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery that they can throw all the stones they want if they have no sin in their lives. The ones who wanted to condemn her couldn't. The one who was perfect Jesus, who could have condemned her, wouldn't. Let's believe that together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing some good news.